Hi, I'm Michelle Murphy, and I'm here in front of our wonderful Guild Hall. It's a beautiful day in the spring, and we're beginning to kick off the very busy season here at Guild Hall, and today we're going to find out a very important subject, and that is about funding and grants for artists something we all are very curious about and today we have a panel of experts who are here to tell us all the ins and outs and joining us today will be Michelle Stark who is the Director of Film and Cultural Affairs here in Suffolk County, Michael Royce who is the Director of the New York Foundation for the Arts and lastly Charlie Bergman who is the Chairman and CEO of the Pollock Krasner Foundation which is right out here. So enjoy, take notes, and profite, as they say in France. I remember several months ago when our trustee, Rebecca Cooper, called me about doing a panel for artists. Since then, the staff, with Rebecca's guidance, have organized a very impressive group of experts in the area of artist funding. Please welcome one of our most hardworking board members and the sponsor of this exhibition, Rebecca Cooper. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you everyone for being here. This panel of experts will share how artists can apply for grants and obtain funding. Guildhall believes that its mission is to help all of the artists in our community, and in this public program, we are reaching out to various funding sources, both locally and in New York City, who help artists. In this day, an artist has to be multi-talented and has to be able to network, apply for grants, know about various funding sources, and how to make themselves accessible for commission opportunities. One question that is always asked by artists over and over is, how can I get a grant? And we feel that this panel discussion will be an introduction to the artists of our community on how and what they should be doing, that is, the very process. Each panelist will speak briefly about themselves and their agency and what funding opportunities are available to the artists and how they can get started. After all the panelists have spoken, Ned Smythe, an NEA grant recipient himself, will moderate a brief discussion amongst them, and then we will open it up to the audience for questions. Charlie Bergman is chairman and CEO of the Pollock Krasner Foundation. The Pollock Krasner Foundation has a dual criteria for the artist, recognizable artistic merit and demonstrable financial need. Artists are given grants worldwide for a year. Michael Royce is the director of the New York Foundation for the Arts. NIFA is famous for its handbook, The Profitable Artist, which empowers artists at critical stages of their careers. NIFA is supported by the New York State Council on the Arts, as well as private and public agencies, foundations, and corporations. Michelle Stark is director of the Department of Film and Cultural Affairs in the Suffolk County Office of Economic Development. It promotes growth in art and film programs that enhance tourism, including the recent restoration of the Performing Arts Center. This is actualized by developing partnerships with local, regional film and tourist organizations. Patricia Snyder, Executive Director of East End Arts Council, has a mission to bring the arts to everyone to inspire support, advocacy, and education, and to help promote low-cost, affordable programs. The Arts Council relies on public and private foundation grant funding, as well as individual and corporate contributions. And Charlie, would you like to begin the program? Is it working? Good. Well, first, let me say that I have been coming out to this gorgeous place since 1961. That was the first year that I came to Guild Hall. So I am delighted to be here today, and I want to thank Ruth Applehoff for her 
hospitality in making this occasion possible. And to you, Rebecca, for your generosity, wherever you are, in making the panel a, a reality. Ruth, you have two outstanding colleagues here that I would like to also mention, Christina Strassfield, your cu chief curator, and Michelle Klein, your registrar, who've done a great deal to make this panel meaningful. Let me say just a word or two about our program. We are a private foundation that gives grants to visual artists internationally. We've been in business for 25 years, and we've made about $56 million worth of grants to artists in 75 countries. We do not support photography, fine art photography, but we do support artists who incorporate photography with, within their painting, sculpture, or printmaking. We should also note that we have a huge volume of applicants from all over the world, from 110 countries, as I speak to you today. I would say candidly that 90% of the artists who apply to us are not professional artists and whose work would not merit a grant from anyone because we're an open application process and anybody may apply. Um, of the 10%, of artists that receive a go-ahead from our committee of selection, and I will speak in a moment about them, I would say that 90% of the 10% that survive the committee of selections scrutiny and review end up getting grants, which is an incredible figure. The first figure is not so happy but I am confident that we are making wise and compassionate and sensible selection in who we pick as our grantees. We have a detailed application that is available on the internet and I would commend to you our website, which is an outstanding one. It is pkf.org, www.pkf.org. And that website illustrates every grantee that, that we've made with two uh, visual images of their work now and to at the time they received their grant. I want to say a word about Lee Krasner Awards. Lee Krasner Awards are based on the same dual criteria of artistic merit and legitimate documentable financial need, but they are by nomination only. You cannot apply for a Lee Krasner Award. They are three-year grants, $30,000 a year for three years. They go to older artists of real distinction and merit, and um, we welcome suggestions and recommendations for such Lee Krasner Awards, but they are a different procedure <clears throat> than um, the regular grants. I think I'm going to stop here.
and turn the panel over to my colleague, Michael Royce. I am honored to be chairman of the Leadership Council of NIFA, and we are honored to have you running NIFA, Michael. Thank you, Charlie. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I just want to say that you may be seeing me doing some hand signals to somebody in the back, and that's my six-year-old daughter, Lindsay, who has since disappeared. Uh, but I watch her come in and out, so if you see me sometimes looking that way and doing a little signal, I'm, I'm not losing my mind, I'm communicating to my daughter. Um, I also want to echo Charlie's words in thanking the board at Guildhall for putting this panel together. Uh, it's a privilege to be out here and to be able to speak to this community. NIFA, for those of you who don't know, is what's known as an arts service organization, and we provide all kinds of services for individual artists in all disciplines. We do this through a variety of ways, either through granting funds directly to artists with the support of the New York State Council on the Arts. We also have many professional development courses, and out of those courses came this book that was referred to called The Profitable Artist, which I will show everybody, and I have three copies in my car for anybody that wishes one. Uh, and you can also order them online through Knife or Amazon.com or Barnes and & Nobles. And we also have a lot of online resources. And if I could take up the panel's time right now, I just want to walk over to the podium for about seven minutes, if that's okay with everyone, and quickly show you the type of resources that we have online so that you see it visually and then you can go back to it once you get back to your home or your studios, because I think you'll appreciate knowing that they're there. Yes? Okay, good. So this, this is one of our resources. It's called Artspire. Uh, Artspire is our fiscal sponsorship program. Fiscal sponsorship allows an artist to have a project that he or she wishes to create and receive a 501c3 attachment to it. So if you apply for fiscal sponsorship at NIFA and you are in fact given fiscal sponsorship, then you can go out and you can raise money from individuals and other sources, and they can receive a tax deduction for the funds that they give to you. This allows you also to go to many foundations. As most of you probably know, foundations, for the most part, cannot give to individuals, neither can corporations. And there are large sums of monies in those two entities for individual artists, but they won't give it to you directly. But if you have a 501c3 attachment through NIFA, then you can receive it. So for those of you that might be interested in raising money that way, this is a good tool to utilize. I'm gonna show you real quickly the website just so you understand how it works and what it has to offer to you. And then I'll bring you to another website that NIFA offers and then I'll go back to my seat so that somebody else can talk. Um, up here, is it mirroring what I'm doing? It is. We'll go to the artist directory as soon as I figure this out. And uh, you'll see here are three projects. There are many, many projects, but here are three that come up immediately. And so what the website does is it allows the artist to communicate to the potential patron or donor what his or her project is about. And then if you want to know more, you click on the project. And this artist seems to have made a video. Uh, let me, and, and I'll see if I can get it running. It's not running. I don't know why. Anyways, <laughs> um, it, it tells you, uh, oh, here we go. Things are all, all kinds of things are happening. <laughs> Um, <laughs> these are photographs by Walter Weissman, and uh, there's a comment section, a list of the donors, and there's a gallery section so he can show you his photographs. And you can put online streaming videos on this so you can talk about your project. You can uh, solicit your donations from this site, and anybody that does donate will receive an acknowledgement letter from NIFA thanking them for their donation to your project, and then they use that letter for the IRS to receive their tax deduction. I just want to see if I can figure out how to work this. Um, maybe this one will work. Now, we probably won't hear any sound, or maybe we will. No, we don't hear any sound. But um, So that's the video that this particular artist created to attract the donor or the patron to his or her project. And then if I could figure out how to scroll down, it's not my computer, so I don't know how to scroll down on this, you would see a lot more information. So I'm now going to quickly take, does anyone have any questions? Well, we'll get to questions later. I'll take you to another resource we have online, which I think you'll also like very much. I 
should have come here and practiced first. So this is the main NIFA website. And here you see we have different tabs. And the one that you'll probably be most interested in is for artist. And if you go to that tab and you scroll down, you see all the different things that we have available for you. But the thing I want to point out here is something called NIFA source. And Charlie knows very much about this particular website. This is a database of all grants that this country has to offer to individual artists, all residencies, in all publications. So if you are, we'll pick a discipline here. Uh, let's go and see what we can find. Let's say you are a person of music and you are a person that deals in classical music. And then you wanna know what opportunities there are for you if you're an artist that deals with classical music. You do a search, and then you see all these opportunities come up for you with all the resources. So what this does for the artist is it saves you time in going online and searching for all this information one by one. It's all right here in one database, and it's absolutely free. Another service that we have here is our newsletter. It goes out every three weeks. It's easy to subscribe to. It's a free service, and it tells you throughout New York State what the deadlines are for people who live, for New York State artists who are residents here, what the deadlines are anywhere in, that's happening in New York State, what the amount of money is, what the discipline is, and that just comes to your inbox every three weeks. So those are some of the resources, but I would encourage you, I want to point out these two main websites. There are many other resources on our website. There's also podcasts, like if you want to know how to market yourself, how to brand yourself, how to use social networking, um, how to use online resources. There's all kinds of free podcasts on here as well. There's over 50 of them. So you can go on at 2 o'clock in the morning when you can't sleep and you're wondering when are you going to get that grant or how are you going to pay that bill, and you can watch one of these podcasts. Um, and I'll answer more questions when we get to the Q&A part, but I did want to show you this. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Isabel Stark. I'm the Director of Film and Cultural Affairs for Suffolk County. Um, that was amazing. I had no idea about that resource. Thank you. Um, we do provide grants to 501c3 organizations. Our funding comes from the hotel motel tax. 10% uh, uh, of the 3% is to promote cultural programs that um, entice visitors to come to Suffolk County, that's the purpose behind it. We also have 2% of that tax that's used for film promotion. So um, the only direct grant we do give to um, individuals would be filmmakers, and that's a finishing grant for productions, feature length productions that have been filmed in Suffolk County, and we've been doing that for five years. Um, you might know the film Paper Man that was filmed in Montauk we provided funding for them to do special effects a couple of years back. Um, so the grants that we have are directed to organizations. And um, for individual artists, I would almost look at it as a subsidy. And um, in fact, we fund Winterfest, which is on the North Fork in the winter. And we provide funding for, I think it's 60 musicians, more? Oh, 250, 60 concerts. So through that grant that we give to um, the East End Arts Council and the Long Island Wine Council, we are providing work for 250 musicians in the dead of winter. Um, so that's one thing we can do to help there. Um, we also, through my, I'm in the Department of Economic Development and Planning, so my role is really to create an environment where artists can thrive. So I connect with programs in downtown revitalization and affordable housing. Um, and in Patchogue, we brought, our, our department brought art space projects to Long Island. We have one um, project in Patchogue, and that's been very successful. Um, part of that project is a gallery space, and there is gallery space there for artists who want to exhibit work at very low cost 
and not just visual artists, other filmmakers, anybody can show work there. Um, and that's through the Patchogue Arts Council and Art Space Patchogue. Um, I wanted to build on what, um, what Roy said about um, the profitable artist. Um, I look at artists as economic actors, um, very important economic actors, especially visual artists who sell their work outside of this area. You're actually exporters and you're bringing in cash and revenue into the economy, which turns over a number of times. So I look at artists as entrepreneurs. And as entrepreneurs, you need to plan, you have to have a business plan, a marketing plan, goals for um, how much money you're gonna make this year, how are you gonna get there. And there's a free service through SUNY Stony Brook called the Small Business Development Center. Um, where you can get help developing a business plan. That's free of charge. And I really recommend every, you know, this is one thing artists don't necessarily think about. It's uh, you are in a business. You're there to sell your work, to make money, uh, to support yourselves. I think that's the long-term goal. And to get there, you have to plan for it. So, um, so that's what I would have to say also as, a bus as an entrepreneur and business person, you need to network and not just with artists, but with people in your community, with business groups, civic organizations and chambers of commerce. If you wanna be taken seriously as, um, as an entrepreneur, as an artist, I think you need to connect with your business community. And that's something that's not terribly difficult. There's chambers of commerce in, in every community out here. Um, it's also a way just to meet potential sponsors and donors, because most businesses uh, on Long Island as elsewhere are large corporations, but small businesses. And that's really where you should be looking for sponsorship. So get out there and develop those relationships. Um, and I think that about covers it for me, but I'll be here for your Q&A also. Thank you. Hi. Yes, it's on. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Pat Snyder with East End Arts in Riverhead. Uh, we've been, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. And uh, with our celebration, we're celebrating the fact that we were awarded the Bank of America Neighborhood Builders Award, um, which is relatively prestigious. And I bring that up because we're really all about building the community and building the community of artists. So we, partner in a very big way with both NIFA and Suffolk County to make that happen. We're like using their resources through us and uh, supporting our artists. For example, we were the host of MARC program with NIFA, um, two years running, and I have to say it's probably, it's one of the strongest programs I've seen for developing business skills that Michelle was talking about. I know we have a couple of people here in the room that were part of, Ni of, part of Mark. Um, so that's really powerful and that's what we offer is the tools and the resources to help you take advantage of the opportunities. Um, Suffolk County, like Michelle said, um, supports the Jazz on the Vine program. So we're the conduit in that we hired the musicians to uh, perform. Um, we make available um, exhibition space for artists and um, not only in our gallery in Riverhead, but we have public spaces as well. We partner with um, the uh, Jamesport Manor Inn in Jamesport, uh, the Rosley Diamond Gallery, which is, w we look for artists that are accomplished and have a strong body of work. Um, it's a beautiful space and it's a wonderful opportunity for work. So uh, even though I would love to say that I have a pot of money that I could uh, hand out to every one of you, um, I don't, um, but we do have those services to help that happen. We have a weekly e-blast whenever we get any kind of information about uh, call for artists or um, grants that are available, anything that would be of service to you, we put that in our e-blast. E um, so we feel that's a really important service um, to our artists. We also are willing and able to work as a fiscal sponsor 
in the event that uh, anyone is doing um, um, independent artist program through NISCA. Now I know it's not visual artists currently. Um, they're serving composers, dance, electronic media, film, and theater. Um, but if there are any artists in the room, or I know this is being public, um, um, presented publicly, um, we will consider uh, being a fiscal sponsor, which you would be required to find to uh, apply for funding. Um, in addition to what I was mentioning, um, our juried shows, I think that's probably, you know, an opportune place for artists, especially um, artists that are starting out, um, to get their work in front of the public. It's not easy being represented by a gallery, as I'm sure you all know, and it's not easy getting a one-person show. But getting that starter as uh, within a juried show um, that's been judged by acclaimed artists is obviously valuable. Currently, we have a show up right now that was judged by April Gornick. Uh, we had nearly 400 entries into the show, um, so it's significant. And um, because there were so many, and um, because of the fact that we partner heavily with our community, we have a sister show at the Historical Society. So some of the work that was not chosen for our show was all, was chosen for the Historical Society. And we're building community in that way that we have two shows going on at the same time, two receptions on the same evening, and um, bolstering our ec economy in downtown Riverhead on the night of the opening. Um, in addition to that, we have um, an artist in residence program. Uh, we have... Uh, had local artists stay in residence and, res and artists from out of the area um, that stay with us in Riverhead, providing the opportunity to uh, learn more about the local community and having easy access to the Hamptons. Um, we also have uh, which a third Thursday and a first Friday program. Those are public forums. A third Thursday takes place at Brecknock Hall in Greenport, and first Friday takes place at Riverhead. Uh, we welcome any artist that wants to do a presentation that night, you know, to come talk to us. If you feel you have, you would like a public forum, um, we encourage you to uh, apply to be, uh, to be a part of that program. And then last but not least, like I said, the resources are what we really can offer you, um, providing space and providing opportunities. We have an ongoing series of workshops that relate to business of the arts. And you can look to our website for scheduling for that. Uh, we've done everything from uh, writing an artist statement, website design, ph photographing your art, marketing yourself, and those programs will continue because if you um, grow yourself as a business person and understand the importance of that business acumen, you'll be better able to um, take advantage of opportunities that come along. Thank you. Um, so, am I on? Yeah, great. So. Um, I think this is a great opportunity because there, as you see, there's a, a pretty wide variety of ways to look at getting money, both on a local level and on a much larger level. And, and actually, um, through you, uh, Michael, you're, you know, it's international. So it, it's kind of amazing. Um, so it's a great opportunity. One thing I'd like to just kind of start off with, and that is, um, the artists, how they even re come to this point. Um, I came to New York in the seven, ni 1970, uh, knew nobody. Um, by luck of, of, by luck, I was picked up hitchhiking uh, by uh, a pickup truck, and they said, "Where are you going, kid?" And I said, "I'm going to Soho," and they laughed. And they said, "Hop in," and it was uh, Keith Sonier, an international artist, showing with. Leo Castelli, and Dickie Landry, who was um, 
a saxophone player from Louisiana who played with Phil Glass, kind of helped Phil put his, um, his band together and played forever with him. Uh, and I came to New York and through them, they said, what are you going to do, kid? And I said, well, I need to find a job. Uh, and they said, well, try, try food. I said, what's food? And they said, well, it, it's a restaurant on, on Prince Street. Uh, and I went there, uh, asked for a job. Um, there were signs in the window saying, um, busboy, waiter, dishwasher. I said, and I, so I went in and I said, I, you know, are there any more busboy jobs? And they said, sure, uh, you could be a busboy, but would you like to be assistant chef? <laughs> and, and I said, wow, uh, what do I have to do? And you know how to boil vegetables? You're, yes. Do you know how to make a salad dressing? Yes. And I was hired. Well, it turned out that this was a restaurant started by another artist, idea, um, uh, Gordon Mata Clark. All the artists at that time happened to either cook, eat, wash. Uh, all of Phil Glass's people were dishwashers. Mabu Mines, uh, Joanne Acolytis, the head of it, was a, a waitress. Um, and for me, it was art school. I never went to art school, but this was art school. So we came in. I was lucky to meet a lot of people, and through that, worked with Gordon Mata Clark cutting buildings, and eventually being invited to show at 112 Green Street, and then it went on. So I was lucky. So many people aren't. And so many people aren't at the right place at the right time. And they're dispersed across the country. So one of the things I'd like to just kind of put out, and I'm not quite sure who to start with on this, and that is the intimidation factor. A, a young artist is working on their art. You know, they're not sure whether they're good or not at that point, particularly young. I'm starting with someone in the beginning of their career. Um, so they're focusing on that. They're trying to scrape up money driving a cab, whatever it is that they're doing to make it. Um, as, a, as, a, as a young person like that, and I think this carries all the way through, this information's out there. But it's overwhelming on a certain level to even know how to go about it. Now, in looking at your site, it's pretty clear, although there's a lot of information. Um, so one of the things is how, uh, how that connection is. Now, this helps, but um, are there ways of reaching out on a much more personal level than a, um, a form letter or even a website? I don't know. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, at NIFA, we have actually something called a hotline. And it's uh, Monday through Friday from 3 to 5. At, you just call the main number. 212-366-6900, um, and you ask for the hotline. Um, and there's, there's always someone on staff to actually answer your questions, no matter what type of artist you are, and no matter what type of challenge you may have in front of you. Now, we may not be able to help you right then and there, but we will get back to you. And often what we do is we invite you in to have a one-on-one -on -one with us, uh, because we are, we've been doing this for 41 years. We're pretty experienced with the challenges that artists encounter on a daily basis. And we have some good resources that we can provide and some advice that we can provide. We also have something called Doctor's Hours. And Doctor's Hours is primarily for visual artists, but this gives the chance for the young, the contemporary, the emerging artists, as you had said, to come into our office and meet with a gallery owner or a curator or a gallerist and show your portfolio, again, one-on-one, -on -one, that personal connection. So it's not intimidating at all. And it's $20, and you get to meet with three individuals. And they will be very honest and very candid about your work. And in some cases, and this is a very rare thing that happens, but I do want to say in some cases, artists have gotten shows in high-end galleries in New York City because of the doctor's hours. Because they come in and they're phenomenally talented. They're undiscovered. Nobody knows they're around. Some curator looks at their work and says, oh my god, I'm putting you into my gallery. So there are ways at NIFA to do it, but I don't know about ways other than NIFA. Yeah. Um, so, and that is the, and, and to go back to a whole other thing of funding, and that is spaces that you've talked about. Again, from my experience, a group of artists in New York started 112 Green Street. One man owned the building, bought it for nothing, uh, before Soho was there. Uh, a group of artists befriended each other through food and through this tiny little community. Uh, and they started, uh, and one of them was a real entrepreneur. Uh, and so he, right off the bat, was into money. 
I'm going to raise money, I'm going to do this, I'm, and, he, and he did. And he kind of funded a place and also built a recording studio. So 112 Green Street had all those things. Um, but the idea of an artist's space or a space where people, a community, you know, and whether it was the Monument Show in New York where a group of artists get together and they do kind of find a space, work with a real estate person or something about a space that's going to be done. So that's another great place. So, but a lot of what's best is if it's artist generated and then comes to the source and says, do you have a space? Or what, you know, deal, you know, dealing with real estate people, but how do you make the connection? So to come to an organization like yours is a, is a really cool thing. I'm wondering, does that happen? Um, I'll, I'll speak about art space. The, the whole genesis of art space in Patchogue actually started with a conversation I had with uh, Steve Hamilton from Bay Street Theater, who was talking about the need to have how much money it was costing to put up artists during the summer season. These are equity um, actors and, and they need housing. Um, and so I started doing research at, to find out what kind of programs might be available for artist housing. So that's an example of, you know, we're government. Um, government is not a friendly pl a place for artists. We're considered these poor stepchildren of economic development, and I am constantly, daily, out there um, talking about how important culture is in, in a local economy. I mean, that's per, I'm out there constantly delivering that message. Um, so I would say we have a lot of empty space. Uh, we have empty strip malls. We have abandoned property, uh, blighted properties. Um, one of the grants that I'm looking at developing uh, through the NEA is looking at blighted properties, looking at you know parking spaces that are underutilized to become a community uh, a community garden, arts and put arts in there, something like that. That's, I, that's just how, this is how I think. This is how I start. So I would say. If you have an idea about space or you go to your local you know, government, come to me, because we know how to deal with real estate people. We know, how, we know the developers. Part of our economic development mission is community development. So we have access to HUD funds, um, access to programs and expertise in those areas. So I would say, you know, come with the idea, and we will help you develop the idea. The one thing that I cannot do is if you come for a handout. I mean, you come and say, you know, just give me, I, I just need money. You know, I, I wish I could give it to you. When I used to counsel businesses in the Small Business Development Center, they would come and say, well, um, I'm here to get money to start my business. And I say, well, you know, we don't have money to start your business. If we had money to start a business, do you think I'd be sitting here? Um, and I'd make a joke like the money truck, yeah, it comes every Thursday and the cash comes flowing out. Money, getting money through government is not easy. The point is, come with a well-developed idea, understand, you know, what it is you're asking for and what the possibilities are, and then we will be happy to help you, you know, develop those ideas from there. Um, okay, another thing that I think is really interesting to kind of get a grip on, and that is the, f the stages of of artists when you first come start making it a young artist haven't shown um, then you do however it works you begin to show a little get a little reputation then actually it begins to take off if you're lucky and you get to what's called a mid-career and that can be a thing like this you shoot up and then you're in here and it's great it's exciting um, you may make some money, you may get an opportunity to teach through it, there's a lot of different things, but um, you can have a thing that kind of rockets up to a great thing, and then all of a sudden, five years later, style changes, everything changes, and all of a sudden, this new person has rocketed up, and this group is down. So you have these ups and downs in careers. Um, and I can look back to Rausham. I can look back to anybody where they were, had, were really doing, and it's not that they weren't uh, really respected, but all of a sudden it wasn't really happening so much for them. So there are these things. So, you know, I presume 
there, and, we've, and you've talked about it certainly, uh, different levels of grants. Um, so there's a beginning grant, there's a mid-career grant, which is a, for usually a very different kind of thing. And I'm wondering even where you've been mid-career and then you're at a whole nother level, I'm not sure, you may have a big name, but actually you're not making, there are a lot of artists that actually get to show internationally and are in museums, but they don't really make money from it. They're paid to come and talk, they're, they're showing everywhere, but the nature of their work isn't really even selling. Um, so there's another person who could have a big reputation, but not be able to live or produce. So uh, you mentioned that, which is kind of great, and there's the one that you're, you're actually invited to versus is there also some that people can go and say, I have this project and be able to work on a project? Let me respond to several things <coughs> that you've raised. First of all, we don't fund projects. We fund individuals for their personal and professional needs. That money can be widely utilized. We, there are certain restrictions that we have. You can't buy property with it but you can restore or refurnish a studio or take care of personal expenses, medical expenses, psychological, dental expenses. We don't, um, we uh, pro prohibit um, well, you're not supposed to use our money for past debts. On the other hand, if you have cancer and your treatment facility says no more treatment until you've paid your bill, we would want you to use our money to clean the slate so that you could continue to get professional help. We don't talk about mid-career uh, we concentrate on quality and excellence regardless of age. We don't fund students. We do fund artists occasionally that are out, recently out of academia. The one thing that we're especially proud of is our sensitivity and generosity to older artists who may at one time have been in vogue, may have been fashionable, and now for whatever reason, no longer are, <clears throat> that's my staff correcting me, Michael. Uh, uh, we, uh, <laughs> we are very uh, aware that times change, galleries close, Dealers t take on different clients, different artists. Um, we try to be extremely flexible in terms of who we help. Uh, we have emergency grants. We have priority grants. We decide what is an emergency and what is a priority. And then we have regular grants, which are the grants that go to artists for the normal slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that are the life of an artist. We have no deadlines because life has no deadlines. That's something that I insisted on 25 years ago. Charlie, let me ask a question then. Um, so as I'm understanding it, um, it's not necessarily a project I want to cast this or I want to build this or I have the opportunity to get this, I, I've talked to you, we have a space and I want to make it for this. It's not, your organization isn't necessarily specific like that, but uh, it sounds like it might be specific if, if an artist is really sick Oops. and they came and then they could say, you know, and then you'll judge if they are or not, but, my, but, but someone could come and say, look, I'm, I'm having a really hard time and I have to do this. Um, and come for us, that to me is a specific kind of grant, no? Yes. Okay. We require references. 
we examine tax returns um, for the year that you're applying, contrast to the year preceding. Uh, the Committee of Selection, I might add, is multidisciplinary and is expert enough to know good art from wherever it comes. So whether it's from Asia or Africa or Europe or whatever, uh, they have qualifications to make good judgment. We also have something called the executive privilege, which is a wonderful concept, which means that the committee of four people can overrule one person on the four person committee can overrule everybody else by invoking an executive privilege. In other words, three people on the committee of four decide that so-and-so is not a good artist, does not deserve support. One person out of that four can say, I'm sorry, I believe this is somebody of real talent, potential, quality, I want that artist investigated. And that's how that happens. And how many times can you pull that card? <laughs> it is unlimited, but it is used judiciously. It is unlimited. So um, let's see. We want to open this up because I'm sure there are a lot of things. Unless anything else that you can. Well, I just want to add yeah, go ahead. that uh, the fellowships that NIFA gives out is for an artist in any stage of his or her career. What the panelists are looking at is a compelling vision or a promise or potential for a compelling vision. And when the panelists look at your submissions, we don't know how old you are. Uh, we don't know your ethnicity. We don't know you, what career level you're at. You can choose to put that in with your resume, your artist statement, but they're really looking at what is in front of them. Then, if you go and you use NIFA source, as I demonstrated, you can actually put in key words such as older or uh, established or disability and see what grants are available specific to where you are in your career. So that's a great way to utilize NIFA source. I would just like to make a plug for NIFA source that we support. There is no other facility. Sorry. <laughs> There's no other facility, and we are asked all the time, uh, where do I turn to for legal advice, for medical help, for this, for that? We, re we invariably recommend that they go to NIFA Source. It is the major resource for artists in need. And the rest of us can put money behind artists, but this is a special contribution. Does anyone else on the panel have a, a thought um, to add to this? Yeah, let me, let me just add that there are funding streams directly through the Huntington Arts Council. Um, there's a decentralization program, and I believe it's in the fall. Um, and they also administer J.P. Morgan Chase funds to individual artists. And I, there was a uh, community connection to the arts, so you'll have to go to their website and, and uh, look further. And I did want to mention, it's similar to the Arts Spire, but Kickstarter, I have seen artists use that website as a uh, stream to gather small increments of donations and you reach a, uh, a goal and, and go forward with a project. So worth considering. Uh, so in, in the audience, um, if there are questions, we have a, a speaker here, so you'll be on film. So could you step up and, and make it that way? That would be great. Yeah, I had two questions, one for Charlie and one for Michael, and clarification questions. Charlie, you mentioned, and this goes to your question, uh, Ned, as well, you mentioned that, um, that you don't, that the foundation doesn't support projects per se, but that it does support um, artists who want to buy artist materials, 
for casting, for whatever, in the normal production of their art. Um, so if an artist had some idea, couldn't they, um, under that uh, category, still apply to the foundation for, um, for artist supplies, for help in producing art? That may eventually end up, because one do doesn't know, in some uh, either gallery or public or museum exhibition. That, that, that was my question for you, and if I may at the same time. Uh, for you, Michael, I was curious if, um, uh, if the source, um, uh, knife a source, also applies to artists both all over the country and also internationally, and if these sources are both um, New York national and international sources that artists can uh, look at and perhaps apply to. Thank not you. targeted to a specific project. Where, or, where a corporation or an individual yeah. should already be paying but, for Yeah, that. but this is an interesting point. So uh, I totally understand. You have a commission. That commission pays for it normally. Theoretically. If, theoretically. It may not pay for all of it, in which case you try to raise money. Exactly. But that is a, something else. But there's a seed money. Usually it's enough. You, hopefully it's enough to do the project. Um, there are other kinds of things, and I'll talk personally. I've been asked by three different organizations in, in the New York area, uh, museum, uh, to do a, uh, shows together at one time, or to do big pieces in each one. None of them have the money to actually make any of the pieces, particularly because of the market today, and they're all just struggling to keep their lights on. Um, and it's not like casting bronze or whatever. It's really just fabricating pieces for, for these exhibitions. That, that's the kind of thing that I think that can happen more and more now uh, because museums, particularly uh, not as prominent museums, have a harder time, or exhibition spaces, um, uh, to actually enable things to happen at the level that they had been happening at those museums. So that would be kind of a project. Now, of course, you probably, if you're lucky enough to have that situation, the museums themselves would begin to write grants. Um, but those are kind of when artists have the opportunity to do something, to come and say, look, I have this opportunity. It's not for a sale. It's not for a corporation. Or, or It could be for a city to show in a park in New York. Um, but that would be a project that isn't necessarily commercially. It's more right. like showing in a gallery or your ex your. I don't, maybe they need to fund the transportation to get the sculpture, whatever, from one place to another place. Cool. And I, I want to just address uh, the clarification. Thank you, Stuart, for actually mentioning that, because it is, Knife of Source is not just New York City or New York State. It is national and it is international. So if you're an artist and you're interested in a residency or a grant program or some kind of other opportunity in Italy or Oslo, it's there on the website. And if it's not there and you know about it, please let us know and we will get it up there. Great. Because we want to make sure it's there. Great, because I've had artists ask me, well, if I'm not a U.S. citizen, can I still, is yes. there still some place to go? Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Michael. Hi. Uh, my name is Irina Vaudar. Um, I'm going to try to formulate this question very clearly and precisely, but I don't know if I'll manage. So, some, uh, Patricia, you mentioned Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah, and Kickstarter is like a really hot source of funding these days. So, this is kind of like a, a form of a thought question. Um, 
I wonder, well, I'm a filmmaker myself. And so um, in filmmaking community, the size of community is booming because there is more and more technology that's available at a cheaper price and therefore it's more accessible. So you have this explosion of people who want to do film. And of course, all of these people um, learn of funding, go to foundations and try to secure grants. Now, it becomes increasingly more complicated to do that because of the booming size of the community. And the end result is that a lot of people go to Kickstarter. Um, even in my particular case, the film that I'm working on right now, I've been funded by um, Sundance Documentary Institute for my first film. With the second one, I applied to them as well, and they had suggested to me, as everybody else right now, to go to Kickstarter to get their seed funds through Kickstarter. And so the first thing they say in terms of approaching uh, Kickstarter campaign is that you got to go to your address book. You got to get all of the people you ever met, all your friends, family, so on and so forth, in order to get funds. Now, for me, it represents like <laughs> a big, like, psychological question. It's difficult for me to go to friends and say, give me money. Um, I'm kind of like old school. I think that I want to go to a foundation who looks at my work, decides on the merit of it, and says, this is great, here's the money, or no, you need to work some more. But this is kind of like, I guess I'm describing a trend, and I would love to hear how you react to this change and maybe help me position my thinking better? I, I'll that. address that. Um, on Artspire, which you had mentioned is similar to Kickstart, it's for the old school and the new school. So if you go through Artspire, it works the same way as Kickstarter. You can apply to foundations and still receive their funds, and then you can have your friends and families also go through Artspire, and you can offer them a tax deduction. Um, but what we do a lot of film workshops at NIFA, and one of the things that I consistently hear from successful filmmakers is because of what you just said, the low cost of technology and everybody's now making films because they can, what's really important to the people that are going to distribute your film, to the people that are going to produce your film, is they want to know how many people, what are your markets, are going to watch your film once they invest in it. And so what they're advising the filmmakers that come to our workshop is before you even create your film, to use social media, social networking, to get people invested in you as a person so that they go see the film because you made it. So whether that's creating a blog or some other page where you're posing questions and you're having a dialogue or using Facebook and you're creating all these fans, make sure you have that community first. Then pitch your film idea to whomever you want to and say, and when this film is produced, I have these 50,000 people who are going to come see this film. But this is what they're saying you can generate today because of the technologies out there. You can build, spend two years working on a fan base, if you will, communicating to all your fans how the film is going, how the plot line's changing, who's investing in it, who you're thinking of casting, developing a real close, intimate relationship so that when it is released, whether it's in an independent house or in someone's living room, you've got paying customers and you've guaranteed that to the distributors. And this is what is being recommended today. I'm not a filmmaker, I don't speak from expertise, but I hear this over and over again. Michael, what about U.S. artists? Don't they have a similar program? Yes, U.S. artists has similar to Kickstarter, similar to Artspire. It's a, it's a micro-philanthropy site where you can put your project on and you can solicit funds from anybody that you wish and receive a tax deduction. So if I can just, you know, see if I got your thought correctly. They're from other people, not mine, but please. All right, from other people. <laughs> but so basically what you're saying is these days um, distributors drive the show and distributors basically bank on the, um, bank on people following the process rather than uh, what the work is and what the work speaks about. You know what I mean? Like they want people who are going to pay to see the film. That's really what it comes down to. Whether the film has any quality or not. Yeah. Right. They want, they want patrons. 
because you know, like this, this is a great subject that you're bringing up. Okay, so here I am, like you know, directing this film, and I'm like, in, in the in the throes of you know, like uncertainty. Is this good? Now this sucks. You know, so like the last thing I want to do is get on the internet and type it up, you know, for the world to read. You know, that's my problem as an artist. Can I? I, I would like to address that. Um, I think. You know, Michael brings up a very, very important point. It goes back to being an entrepreneur and a business, um, entrepreneurial uh, thinking. R rather, you know, even if you don't think of yourself as a business person, part of your job as an artist is to get your message out there and to connect with people, whether you're a filmmaker, theater person, and social media is the way to do it. You don't have to be on the internet all day long, but you should schedule time every day or every other day, whatever that amount of time is, it's, it's, a, it's something you must do and you have to be disciplined about it. Um, and I would say you're the one driving your project. I mean, it's up to you to sell your project. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, if you're, if you're shy, if, um, if you tend to, you know, hold back and this doesn't come naturally, it's a skill that you need to develop, and um, over t and you can over time. I think. I just add to that. Um, besides public speaking, asking for money is very, very hard. The, probably two of the hardest things to do for most people, and you really do have to change your mindset. You're not asking for money. You're asking for support, or you're inviting someone to share the opportunity of making something happen. But you, you totally do have to change your mindset on that. Mm -hmm. So I, we're going to have to allow some other people. Absolutely. So we're going to move on. But what I'd like to kind of um, just approach it from the other side. Because when I hear a lot about business and art, and you see uh, students coming out of graduate school now knowing exactly how to do this and knowing what suit to wear and what um, uh, business card to have. And uh, you begin to see when you're with uh, grad students, people that are really good businessmen, mm, the art's not so interesting. Um, so one of the things that I throw out to the panel and that is, you know, artists have gone into it for a lot of reasons. It's probably because they, that's what they do. It's not, it's not that they can't necessarily do this or that. That's what they do. But a lot of them can't do that. That's kind of why the set up. Um, but yes, I think there's a real need to be able to reach people who aren't business. Because I don't think art is about business. Certainly being successful is about business. Certainly about being famous is about business, but making great art isn't about business. And so, but we're in the real world, so I had to learn a lot. I came out of an art historical background. The goal of making art was having respect by your peers. It wasn't about selling. In fact, that was not even, you know, that was not good. That was a pejorative. But I do think there is a connection how the artist that is inner or shy and how the organizations that are set up to help that artist, this is an ongoing issue. And, you know, I'm sure it's stuff that you guys think about, right? Well, if I could just say, just to make it very clear, NIFA does both. So we do give out money that represents compelling, high-quality voices that come from the inner core of a human that needs to be expressed and we all need to see what that's about, right? Because they bear witness to our culture and make us better citizens. So that has never changed. But there's another side that we also offer for those artists that are interested in using their entrepreneurial skills. We try to provide as many resources and ways of advancing your career as possible. Which I think is really important and if you're a filmmaker, you got to have them. Because what a filmmaker is, is a producer on a certain level, right? You've got to not just sit there and do your thing. You've got to have a, uh, people doing, you have actors, you have video, you know, the person who's behind the lens, you've got the editor, you're a producer. So, so on a certain level, different fields require different personalities. So that makes sense. 
It's just the people who are really inner is the ones we gotta look out for. That's why I think organizations where, where groups of those people can be supported by each other, find a space, they get a voice. Uh, and then groups of people who have been lucky enough to have a career and are looking around and they see something and they go, they bring that person's name up to an organization, say, you know, this person's really, so, and it's as well, although it takes an enormous amount of time and that is daunting to go on all these sites while you're trying to make money and work. So it is a juggling act. Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Sarah Douglas and I have a question about funding scholarship and other funding opportunities for art education both at the undergraduate and the graduate level. Art, for art education. Um, there are funds through NISCA for arts integration. Um, the program is, I would say, probably in a little bit of a transition. But if you go to NISCA, nysca.org, um, the focus is bringing the arts into the schools and into the broad curriculum. Um, integrating into the curriculum. So, um, and there are statewide organizations that are attached to NISCA and arts education that. So would these be for attending undergraduate and graduate programs or no. for? No, no, you, you won't, I doubt that you will find money to, for education themselves. You're looking for scholarship for training, not, oh, I see, yes. okay, um, sorry. I, I don't, I'm not, just not familiar, not to say there aren't, but. Try knife a source, just yeah, type in scholarships. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, uh, one quick one. <laughs> very, very quick. No, it's also very specific. It's for Michelle, you back her up. I didn't see. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's very specific. It just has to do with uh, the the source that you mentioned, the uh, independent what is it, uh, the business plan, small business development center. Yes. Uh, is there a website or how do we find out specifically how to? Um, yes, there is. You can uh, contact me. I'll give you my email if you if you'd like to contact me. I'll give you that information. Okay. It's Michelle M I C H E L L E, dot Stark S T A R K, at Suffolk County NY, that's one word, dot gov, dot gov. And I, I frequently get calls from filmmakers looking for funding. Um, what, what I can help you with, you're a documentary filmmaker? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> um, I could put you in touch with some people I know. I mean, in Boston, there are some groups I think that you could probably benefit from belonging to just for um, networking and, and learning what's going on with other documentary filmmakers, so I'll give you some of those sources. Great, okay. You. Thanks very much. One more. Do we have time for one more? Okay, cool. I talk fast. I talk fast. <laughs> I'm Marion Wahlberg Weiss. I really appreciate what you all are doing. You're fabulous. And you're so idealistic, and that's even more fabulous. This is for another thing, Ned. Okay, this is your mission. Do another thing on, they're thinking of, uh, you know, doing away with some of Medicare. The arts are gonna be, forget. So how has the um, crisis, you know, affected everybody? Nobody said that, you're skirting the issue and I feel so sorry for you all to have to deal with this. Please be honest, we're in dire trouble. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> um, locally, I, I would, you know, I can't really say what my opinion either way, but I would say locally, go to your legislators. Uh, on the South Shore, you have Legislator Schneiderman. On the North Fork, you have Legislator Romaine. I, you know, work for the executive, but all of our funding, everything that comes through the county, is touched by your legislators. Let them know what you're doing. That's really, really important. And that's on a local level. Same thing with your town or village governments. 
I think people tend to focus on the federal uh, issues that are going on, but it, which is important, but really you make the most difference locally. That's where you really have some power. We have, we have a tremendous resource um, by way of WPPB radio. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but Bonnie Grice has a program every morning and focuses on the arts, brings people in. I know people here have been in the studio talking to the public, and it's very powerful. Um, so don't forget that. That's 88.3. Well, I, if there are no other questions, I thank you all for coming on this day. And uh, a great resource, and a great resource to feel comfortable with.